Thank you, Director, sir, and all the officers, judicial officers present over here. Well, I'm really honored to be able to be given a chance to say a few words on a few topics which has been delegated to me to talk about. But I know that all of you are more knowledgeable on these topics than me. I might be able to only highlight a few portions of it. I don't know how much that will be helpful to all of you. So without wasting my time, let me start with the topics. That is deoxyribonyl Greek acid and the evidence of DNA in a game, as a game changer in judicial decision making. Now DNA, the analysis of DNA has revolutionized the field of forensic science providing accurate and reliable evidence for use in several directions in criminal investigations and also in forensic medicine and forensic science analysis and ultimately we go in for the last ultimate portion in any criminal investigations of judicial decision making. For all the crimes they ultimately end in the court. So this presentation will explore the history and the development of DNA analysis and its impact on judicial decision making and the challenges and limitations in its use. In 1953, Watson and Crick, he laid the foundation for the development of the DNA analysis technique. And in 1985, the first of DNA evidence in a clinical tri trial resulted in conviction making it a turning point in the use of DNA analysis as a forensic tool. DNA analysis has undergone a significant impact on judicial decision making, providing powerful evidence that can either convict a person or exonerate or acquit a person who might be a suspect or might not be a suspect. This use of evidence has led to the exoneration of numerous wrongfully convicted persons who by verdict has been proved by law as being an accused. But because since all of you know law is blind and it depends on only on evidence, the hands of the judiciary, the judge, has, is are bound and they cannot go despite knowing the fact that he or she might not be a suspect or guilty that person he has no role in that but according to the evidence that has been provided to him and according to every all the circumstances he has to come to a justice to a verdict which might prove wrong later on and once it is proved wrong, it is later on opened up also depending upon the case, merit of the case and later this person might be found that he is not at all guilty. So despite its many benefits, DNA also poses problems and challenges and it has limitations. This I will talk about later on as we progress. Because how DNA can show its limitations? There can be the amount of sample might be very small. Then they might be contaminated with other objects. And first of all and foremost of it is there must be a control to match the DNA. If there is no profile of DNA in the database of a criminal, then it's very difficult in certain cases to match the problem DNA to find out whether this person is a suspect or not. So as the advancement in DNA analysis technology continues to the capabilities and accuracy of this forensic tool, new techniques have also come out 
day by day to help its advancement as genetic sequencing and finding out the genome or the genetic nature of the sample that has been collected. And this has increased the reliability and accuracy and precision of the DNA technology in its usefulness. This is one slide which I'm, the next one will be a, a more detailed one. That is, despite the more challenges and limitations of the DNA, we can only say that it is a helping or assisting tool and cannot ignore the analysis and the DNA uh, evidence in the courtroom. We can say in certain cases that this person is not accused. But we cannot stamp that he has not committed guilty, committed any crime. The next one. As I've told you before, the same things. DNA doesn't have in the normal course any duplicate. In about, there are about 35 genes in the human bodies and 100 million nucleotides in one DNA molecule. And the DNAs they make, they can be either mitochondrial, they can be found either in the mitochondria of a cell or in the ribosomes. It is as I told you, I have already told you these, that is, it has sugar, it has phosphate, it has bases. The bases are four, ATGC, adenine, thymine, guanine and cytosine. And they pair in a particular sequence. They don't pair as and how it likes. So, they pair, A pairs with T and G with C. If they pair in a wrong sequence, then there won't be any match. And if they pair, if how the DNA analysis is made, from that you will understand, there are portions, definite portions of there known as codon. That is made up of a few base pairs to make a small, short portion, and that is a codon. And in the DNA sequence, if one part has a sequence, which doesn't match with the other part, other strand, then that is known as miscoding or nonsense coding. This importance of DNA sequence has that one strand is based with its paired nucleus. That is, if, if there is ATGC, a C T A A C C G A C. You can certainly say what the other strand of the DNA molecule will have. So that is from this you can say the sequence of the other strand strand will be what will it be? The other strand will be T A G C T C T G A T. T, G, G, A, T, G. Just of the binding pairs. There will be the binding pairs. Now, if this pair differs, then there is no matching between the two. So that DNA which you have found from the sample of the suspect, it doesn't match. If it is differs in at least 50% of the cells, of the strands, then that DNA is not a match. And if it doesn't differ, if it has the analogous bearing, uh, pairing basis in the other strand, then the sample of the suspect, which have been found to match this, will, you can say that this in suspect has the same as that of the sample which has been sent. That means, what you do in a from the crime scene, if you just collect the DNA sample and you send it to the laboratory, the forensic science laboratory, for sampling, genome finding, characteristic finding, karyotyping, that is chromosomal typing. 
So if you do that, there are steps to do that. And if you do that, and you find that, you have to take the control from the suspect. Taking the control from the suspect and allowing both the things, the samples and the suspect sample, both undergoing the process of DNA analysis, you find that the two, sus two the sample and the suspect sample, that is a control, they match. Then that person can be say that he is guilty. And if they don't match, then you can acquit that person from the from having comment, uh, committing the offence, the crime. So as I told you, if the sequence is not correctly made, then a portion of that DNA is known as nonsense codon, and that leads to the mutations which we have nowadays, usually in influenza virus or in the COVID viruses, what we are finding, the mutations we are finding. At first we are finding some DNA sequence in the COVID and later on that is changing to another DNA sequence. Like in influenza, you can have two types of influenza virus, H and N, H1 and N, N1 or H2 and N2. There are five paired things, uh, types of it, H1, 2, 3, 4, 5, N1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And they can pair amongst each other in innumerable combinations. So might be what influenza you are having now, you are suffering from now, say you are suffering from H1N1 virus. But later on you find that the medicines which you have given for that particular type of influenza is no longer acting because that has already undergone mutation due to perhaps exposure to medicines repeatedly, same medicine repeatedly or due to environmental changes or due to reinfection by some other uh, person's karyotype virus and there can be recombinant DNA that means it is matching with one with the other. Both together they are producing a mixture of the two and this can lead to that the next time when you are treating that patient this patient is not responding because the gene has already mutated. Similarly in COVID also, the vaccine we used to get at the first time, now that vaccine is not responding on us because it has undergone mutation. So the importance of this base pair, they can, that is one strand based on the sequence of the other, you can predict. It is responsible for replication and transcription and it can repair, it. DNA damage can be repaired. About 99.9% .9 of all the human beings have the same sort, specific sequence, only 0.1% of any individual is unique for that person. They have a specific codon sequence. And this, that means each person has 99.9% .9 same strand, but only 1.1% person is different from the other man. So no one, no two individuals has the same type of DNA pattern, sequence of DNA pattern. From where you find the DNA? DNA can be collected from all these samples, that is blood, semen, skin, cells, tissues, organs, muscles, brain cells, bones, teeth, hair, saliva, mucus, perspiration, that is sweat, fingernails. If uh, uh, someone is an accused of a rape, a sexual assault, then his or her, his fingernails might have a skin underneath the nails. From that, or scraping the nails, you can find, you can take that sample and put it into the procedure of DNA analysis and you'll find that this person had some linking with the victim. So fingernails is important in that case. Amongst all these, what we collect usually in a living subject is blood, 
semen, then uh, hair, saliva, fingernails. These are main ones which we keep. The identity of the individual is cannot be found. Unknown bodies. You take. You can usually we take bone marrow, teeth, then uh, a long bone with the tissues attached to it and we keep it, tell them to preserve it without any preservative but only on dry. Just dry it and put it for further DNA processing. So what is the use of DNA sequencing or finding out the DNA profile in our discipline that is forensics. To identify potential suspects to exonerate persons wrongly accused of crime, to identify crime and criminal investigations, identify catastrophe and natural disaster victims, identify persons who are otherwise difficult to establish, that is in decomposed, completely burnt, skeletonized or mutilated people. To solve any dispute of identification, establish paternity and other relationship, Detect mutated genes, genome mapping and genetic disease analysis. The last one is important for certain diseases which have yet to be uh, undergone, which has to undergo several research processes like multiple myelosis, uh, multiple sclerosis, multiple myeloma. These are the things where the genome typing has to go undergo. But till date there is no cure for all these. Parkinsonism, Alzheimer's disease, they have no cure. They are under genetic engineering processes. Now in case of paternity dispute, that is very important, and you take the, pater the blood or usually blood is a sample with CSFL or FSSL. It, it is done by Central Forensic Science Laboratory usually. They take it and in there is a process of that and they try to match it with the suspected baby who the mother uh, uh, tries to prove that he is the biological father of that child. But there is no such test called maternal uh, maternity detection. Because it, why? Because each baby there are two types of chromosomes, one autosomal, the other one is sexual, that is sex chromosomes. Sex chromosomes has in case of a female XX, this formula, XX and the, in case of male it is XY. So when these two come, these two genes they come into uh, combination, you can have two child of XX XY, that means two each. XX, XY. Again, if you break it down, then it will be XX, XY. So, Y chromosome is more important. Hence, paternity detection is more important than maternity detection because the father, the male person, also has X chromosome. But Y chromosome is only found in male person. So, if you can find that is easier. That is easier to detect and easier to find out whether this is a biological, so he is a biological father of that child or not. But someone has questioned also why not the maternity detection also? Because of the fact that extramarital affairs also occur and then she can also go in for, after living with her own husband, can go in for extramarital affairs and there the mother can be at fault. But still that is not in vogue. Then in uh, cases of decomposed, completely burned, skeletonized, mutilated people where you have nothing else but only the bones can be taken because postmortem blood has no such value in DNA examination as fresh blood. It has value but not much importance. So the bones here act as a sample, as a specimen. Tooth can act, hair can act if not completely singed in burnt cases. It is first degree completely total burnt, first second degree. 
then fresh burns. You will get a charred body with most of the organs burned. So in that case, hair will also get singed. And the DNA stays not at the end portion but at the bulb, that is the root portion of the hair. So DNA analysis has been established in 1980 by Alec Jeffries, an English geneticist. And forensic scientists scan 13 DNA regions or loci and create a DNA profile for that person which is known as DNA fingerprinting. Taking apart from all the other fingerprints to establish identity as we know, that is dactylography, iris print, footprint, handprint, poroscopy, everything, the most accurate one is DNA fingerprinting. In criminal cases, samples are collected from the crime scene and from one or more suspects. Extracting the DNA and analyze, analyzing it for a set of specific DNA markers. Markers are found in the DNA by making small pieces of DNA probes that will seek out and bind to a complementary DNA sequence in the sample. More probers use, more probes use, greater the odds for a unique pattern definite match. At least four to six probes are recommended. Now this is what that is, if you take, collect a sample from the crime scene and then send it to the lab, what they do first? This collection is also very important. That is, they have to collect in a specific method and send to the laboratory as quick as possible in the proper, properly packed, sealed, labeled package. Otherwise, the chain of custody cannot be maintained. This you know, I don't have to go into that. To maintain the chain of custody and be acceptable to the court, you have to document it that this was the sample which you have sent. After reaching the laboratory, they go put the DNA into three sequential patterns. One, extraction. Second, fragmentation. Third, um, replication and then putting them into the machines to find out the DNA nature. This I already told you whether he is a suspect or not a suspect. And the portions must be large enough to exclude any fallacy or to give it more precision and accuracy. To show there was no random bias, that is, it has been taken genuinely from that particular specific person and has been sent for DNA analysis. CODIS is a system that is combined DNA index system. Now this is what, uh, here the judiciary portion also, even the per people also bring the legal factor in it. That is, you should have a D database, DNA database. Now, whether this is legal or not, because once a criminal, once an accused is caught, is booked, then he loses a right after trial when he is stamped as uh, an offender in the portion, he is convicted, then he loses a right to not to say that he won't give any sample that he has to give those his blood sample if needed to put uh, to create a DNA bank or DNA database so that if later on after getting out from the prison he comes commits another crime then very quickly that sample can be matched from the DNA database but in living persons it is you can't take it for granted that everyone will give you their blood sample to create the data bank. Because once that is ensured, then what happens, this person might, even if he has not committed anything, or might have committed very petty crimes, might be booked due to the corruption of certain systems, uh, I don't want to name that, uh, they might book this person for as having been the offender. So here, his confidentiality, his privacy, his rights, fundamental rights, according to the Constitution of India, that is lost. 
he is being forced to do it and you can never force a person to give a DNA sample. So, just for, so as every um, regulation, so every system has its pros, it has its cons. That means it has its advantages and disadvantages. So here the pro is or advantages you have a large pool of data bank to match the DNA so that you can uh, detect that suspect, that criminal offender at once immediately without delay. But in the other one where you talk about cons or disadvantages you will find that this person has lost his rights, fundamental rights and privacy. He might not have committed crime, he will never commit a crime, yet he might be booked. Just like an example out of the way, a vehicle which has been booked once under CCTV surveillance of having broken the MV Act and has been fined. Once the number come, goes over to the home department, to the police data bank, by mistake, that same vehicle might be, I think it's not working or what? It's working. Might be again booked for the same. Like, if there is a number carried at 8 in one of its numbers, later on, by mistake, it can be a 3. Manual, manual surveillance and they'll check the data bank of their vehicle registration and they'll find that yes this vehicle had once committed a crime. So again and again you'll get a uh, MVA uh, document that you have broken certain MV acts. So this is this also happens in DNA databases and the national DNA index system is a part of CODIS and it contains DNA profile at a national, state or local level and is accessible to the law enforcement over the country. So where DNA acts as evidence, easily contaminated misleading result, many guidelines for handling of samples, degradation, monitor collection and storage, successful extraction by PCR technology. These are actually fallacies where evidence can be lost. DNA can be denatured, DNA can be destroyed, small amount of sample can be supplied and if the collection and storage proper, uh, pro, uh, methods are not proper, improper, then that DNA becomes futile, useless and the process of DNA extraction and DNA technology defined as the genomic character can be violated also due to delay, due to defective analysis, due to defective skills of finding out whether that person, that person who is the for instance scientist might have not have enough skill to find out whether this is correct or not or there might be a um, mistakenly say the sample was sample number one he has mistakenly taken his sample number two and put it over there. Human, it's a human one. He has, uh, he can make errors. DNA te uh, testing process comprised of four steps, as I told you: extraction, quantitation, amplification, capillary electrophoresis. Extraction can be done by manual methods, by commercially available kits, by FNAC finding the aspiration cytology from frozen section of tissues from formerly fixed paraffin embedded tissues. Manually you can collect blood, soak it in the blotting paper. This is the normal process which is done and dry it and how do you, that blotting paper soaking is also very important. You take a blotting paper, put drops of blood on it, not together in a huge amount 10 or 12 drops and then it will spread amongst like itself, dry it, fold it into four folds, pack it in the 
in an envelope and send it. Before that, you have to fill up a document, a form. And in that form, there will be a picture, a photograph of that person, signature of that person, and all the details they want, along with consent of the informed consent of that person that he is giving the sample for DNA analysis. Because I told you, if that person has not lost his right to give informed consent, he may say, he may defy to not to give the sample. That is his right. The tool used are centrifuge, with centrifuge is separate. Centrifuge is a machine with circular, uh, uh, it revolves at a particular rate, RPM per minute, that is the rates per minute. It circulates depending upon the sample which you use. If it's a heavier sample, you have to increase the RPM. If it's a lighter sample, you can go in for a lighter one. So that it's uh, the components of are separated easily, like blood only, white cells, red cells, the plasma, the platelets, that can be separated. We take only the plasma portion and the RBC, uh, and the WBCs, because there are two types. One is, as I told you, a nuclear DNA, the other one is a ribosomal DNA. After that, you allow it to stand like that and press stage. You stop the rotation, allow it to press stage. Then wash it by graded ethanol, graded concentration of ethanol and or isopropanol or you can take an agarose gel by which it can absorb the part which is needed. It will give bands in the agarose gel depending upon the weight. If it is neutrophils or white blood cells, it will just get absorbed at a portion of the gel. Gel is nothing but a tissue paper sort where it slowly gets, like I think uh, you know about those malaria kits, dengue kits, even pregnancy test kits. It's nothing but just diffuses by osmosis depending upon the molecular weight and the uh, size of the molecules and by that it gives linear bands of different DNA weight according to the molecules. And those bands can be read in a spectrophotometry, nano drop spectrophoto spectrophotometer under ultraviolet light. It absorbed by the bases. The amount of light absorbed is proportional to the concentration of the DNA in the sample. As I told you, there will be bands, and those bands will be specific. Say, if you have three bands in the front portion, then a gap, another band, then another gap, and two bands, then another gap, and you have the same thing, same sort of sequence in the suspect's DNA, then there will be a match. But you have in the suspect's DNA three bands, then there is a great gap, then two bands, again a gap, then that suspect, that DNA of the suspect is not the sample sent to you. There is no match. Amplification is done by polymerase chain reaction. In this reaction, you use ribonuclease, DNA polymerase extension by ribonucleic endonucleases. R endonucleases, ribonuclease. Technique. And what happens is, first you cleave the two strands of DNA and then when it is separated, you go in for washing and annealing the DNA strands and then you amplify it. That is, you increase the number of those DNA strands and that is done by polymerase chain reactions. It goes on multiplying just like um, your mitotic divisions with cleaves and then it in a this actually occurs in a viral viral that is in a virus infection they have the capacity to replicate in a <coughs> very quick sequence and build up the same DNA RNA patterns in the 
or DNA at times, the DNA virus is also in the bacteriophage, that is um, the bacteria, they has the ability, the, those, uh, this is a bit uh, different, phages means they engulf. This engulfment is done by one of the cells in our blood, that is macrophages. They engulf the bacterial membrane, bacteria, and they have the capacity also this combined portion has the capacity to engulf the viruses and inside them the viruses replicate by the same sequence. Capillary electrophoresis, I have already told you, that is, with a capillary tube, very fine tube, you put some fluid into the sample and slowly there is a osmosis and the DNA is, uh, that sample is gets absorbed into the gel agarose, agarose gel or any other gel substances and that part becomes laden with DNA. These are short tandem repeats. Short tandem repeat analysis is in a part of a DNA molecular strand if you take about 1 to 10 base repeats that means small one or might be, it is actually codons. A codon is made up of a full three or four bases and then that short repeat can be, can be repeated. It forms into short, short, uh, short uh, strands. That means it, three or four bases together makes one uh, repeat. It's called a repeat. One um, molecule part, and that is again repeated. It can be the repeats can be can have multiple sequences. Can be of three. Can be of ten. Can be of seven. But this happens when the amount is even one microgram to ten nanograms. So the fact that this person has uh, the fallacy that there was a very small amount of DNA. That is also cannot be justified because it acts in one microgram to ten nanograms. That there also will find these short tandem repeats. So the first fallacy that amount was small, therefore the DNA profile couldn't could have not been detected. That is wrong. In the most common type of DNA profiling, as you find it is for criminal cases and other forensic uses, this YSTR. YSTR is done in paternity tests in male. There's only Y uh, chromosome is found only in male. So in male DNA of one or more multiple donors, you can get this profile as a reference samples. RFLP. RFLP is restriction fragment length polymorphism. Difference in homologous DNA sequences that can be detected by the presence of fragments of different lengths after the addition of the DNA samples in question with specific restriction endonucleases. You break the DNA into small portions for restriction in the name cases, cleaves double standard DNAs into two parts, into a single strand, and then the enzyme restriction in the name case, they have specific sites of action like AT and GC. They have AT, they have two uh, sites where it can bind with three sites of G and C. That's why the combination is in that way. That is, in A and P, A has two sides, T has three sides, and they combine in this way. If you put it in this way, combine in this way. Two sides with three sides, binding. G and C also has that. G has two sides and C has three sides. So, now if you want to find out whether this particular DNA repeat is that of a suspect, what you do, you put a radioactive carbon or radioactive iodine is usually used. That, iodine, that radioactive iodine is infiltrated into that particular codon. See, at random you uh, select third codon, eighth codon, twelfth codon. And that radioactive iodine that can give 
a scintillation that is markers when put under a Gaga counter. And from that markers, you can map a gene, gene mapping and you can find out whether the suspect also has that particular codon in, that, in them. So it is not, they won't, they won't combine with any other. They have a specific attraction for particular codons. Those radioactive probes can, they don't uh, take, if you give a C, in C you give a probe of radioactive iodine, then all the C's will take up the radioactive iodine at particular sites. And those radioactive iodine, they will go and give a scintillation of band markers over in the Gaga counter. And you can find where it is located from that in the suspect sample you can find that. Find the those probes which has been radioactively radioactively activated. Gel electrophoresis, I told you already, denaturation, it is done in place, placed in sodium hydroxide solution to produce single stranded DNA. Then the type of DNA analysis is done is by southern blotting type. The single stranded DNA is transferred into a charged membrane like nitrocellulose paper by a process called capillary or electro blotting. This transferred nitrocellulose paper is fixed by autoclave. Autoclave is nothing but a auto heating apparatus which dries up the thing and fixes the nitrocellulose paper so that it doesn't get denatured. Then it is blocked by using bovine serum albumin to prevent the binding of the label probe non-specifically to the charge membrane. That is a probe can only in, uh, enter at places where it is desired to enter. It cannot enter at any place. Then comes hybridization, visualization. As I've told you, they form color bands under visualization by autoradiography. The laws related to DNA technology, there are several laws varying from state to state. DNA can last for many years. Hence, the statute that DNA has been lost, sample has been lost, cannot be accepted. The second fallacy is cannot be accepted. Third, it limits the duration between crime and crime and conviction. If you can find out the genome mapping, from the genome mapping, the DNA of that suspect and the sample matches, then the delay in giving justice will be reduced and you can convict the person. Statutes becoming obsolete due to the reliability of properly stored DNA in a sample. This can be one of the fallacy that it has not been properly stored, not been properly collected. DNA databases lead to convictions, which is also, if you have a CODIS by CODIS system, have a DNA database, you will, law is ensured and you can find out that person will be convicted. And some convicted of uh, offenders are required for, as I told you, they lose their rights and have to give uh, samples for DNA databases. These are the uh, instruments which are used, DNA thermocycler and genetic analyzer and DNA for polymerase chain reaction DNA, thermostable polymerase cycler. This is what I was going to tell you before. If this is a sequence of suspect 1 and that is a sequence of suspect 2, that is a question sequence and you have a known sample of the subject and you put those two samples to match the two, you will find that at places they are not matching in suspect 1. So it is that suspect is excluded and there is no match. In the second one, it is included and there is a match. So suspect victim to the object and to the scene they are all interrelated. You can easily find out from the DNA analysis that this is a suspect and that is not the suspect. For DNA testing, uh, you need HNA mapping, that is histocompatibility, leukocyte antigen map matching. And these are not much. This chain of custody, as I told you, this has to be ensured. DNA samples not contaminated. Proper paperwork required for court proceedings. 
Data collected by third party laboratory professionals that has to be ensured by documentation. Glass should be worn, caution observed, collected seal packed properly, label. Receiving laboratory will first check if that collected sample has all these documents and then only can accept that this is the sample which has been sent. Apart from exclusion inclusion matches in conclusive results, from possible contamination, very small amount, degraded, this, as I have told you, cannot produce a data profile, but this is also not that big of a fallacy. Examination of Lacuni, previously convicted for a crime, found to be innocent later on from DNA sampling. DNA testing, most common method of post conviction exoneration of wrongly accused. That is, after conviction, if the case is reopened from DNA sampling of this. You can find out that he has not been ex uh, he has he was not guilty and he can be exempted he can be his uh, conviction can be stopped and can be released but by that time he has already lost some years in the prison and who will give back in those five years or ten years in the prison which the time has consumed to find out DNA sampling and most of the exonerated persons were convicted of rape and assault. In most of the cases, we find that what we say rape is not actually committed. They have brought false allegations of rape or assault due to some other purpose. Maximum, maximally, you find it is property, land, property, wealth, or family dispute. Small ones, they are booked. They are made to, they are just uh, prepared to say that they have been raped. When you try to go on asking the history on and on, over and over again, you will find that they say no. They differ. The, their statements differ from the police to the doctor to the court. When you go for 164, you will find that they differ. And because they are at times being suppressed by fear and fright from their parents to say certain such things, but actually that has not happened. So in that cases, in our place, it is almost 90 to 95 percent of the cases are not true rape. It is false ones. But that takes time to prove, because here, law is blind. He will depend on, it will depend on, she will depend upon evidence. All the evidences are there. The person has been booked for it. But the circumstances, the eyewitnesses, they give certain other witness. And if that is proved that the witness is correct to some extent, the judiciary officer has nothing to do, the presiding officer has nothing to do with it, but has to pass the verdict. Later on, when they appeal to the higher courts, they can be rejected or they can be accepted that they have not done, committed any crime. But that, by that time, he has already suffered a lot of harassment. The first convicted defendant to be exonerated by DNA evidence testing in 1989 in Virginia. She was uh, con erroneously convicted of sexual assault. He was erroneously convicted of sexual assault following by, followed by hanging a woman in her Arlington County, Virginia home and sentenced to 35 years in prison. Conviction was on the basis of two witnesses, placed him near the sign. He was seen near the scene of crime. Eyewitnesses misidentified the person and has pleaded. He pleaded guilty because he dreamt that he had committed the crime. If you go on barging a person, you have done it, you have done it, you have done it. What will you do? At one time, you will say, ha, I have done it. And you will start going on in sleep, in waking, in everywhere, they find that he is dreaming that he has committed the crime. And he says, okay, I've done it. But then three laboratories conducted DNA testing of this case, found that the pubic hair from the scene of crime inconclusive with vast quiz. Exterminated in 1989 after having served five years of his sentence. Who is at fault? Who will give him back his five years? Here. Yeah. Law has no answer. No people has any answer. But what he has lost, he has lost not only five years, he has lost his station, social status. He has become a social stigma. He has lost his profession, his job, his money, everything. But no one is there to give him 
that five bags. Justice for all wants reserved for those convicted of violent offenses, but now for anyone charged with a crime. Police has been, often, uh, has been given authority to collect DNA from any person arrested on suspicion of a recordable offense, although charged or not. Innocent Peoples provides a databases to get results, but becomes an automatic suspect for any crime in future, undermines principle of presumptive innocence, and lists the databases, jeopardize employment, foreign travel, but can be used for genetic correlation of criminal behavior if he commits later on any other crime. So is DNA database a violation of privacy? This is for you to decide whether it's a violation of privacy or not. Thank you. So if you have anything to ask. Ma'am, just one thing. <clears throat> one question. Uh, find for a uh, compared DNA testing of uh, a person whose father and grandfather is expired but he's claiming to be the grandson of a particular person and then he wants the comparison of DNA uh, uh, to, with his uh, uncle and cousins. So how accurate is that? Is it possible? Yes, if the court orders. Yes. yes so how accurate the is the, How correct is the result? How correct is the result? It, is, it depends upon the sampling of the results which are found from the samples, whether it matches or not. <coughs> he's, you said that he has been, he is thinking that he is not, he is his father. He is claiming to be the grandson. His grandson. Such and such person. Yes, it is, it is, is, it is, it is, it is uh, there through, is, yes, through maternal or maternal? Uh, paternal. Paternal, that is more probable. More probable. Because the DNA sequence, if it is a heterologous or a homogeneous heterogeneous, this is two types. It becomes autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive. That means big XX and small XX. These are autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive. First big XX is dominant, second small XX is recessive. But heterologous is big X and small X. So in that case, if you cleave the two, you get one chromosome from one and the other chromosome from the other. So if you cleave that two, even in uh, males also, that is the short arm of the, of the Y, that is not there. Of the X rather, that is not there, it forms a Y chromosome. That also cleaved into two parts during um, the process of reproduction. One comes from the oocyte, the other one from the sperm. And they break up into two, four types. That is X, Y, X, X. From male, you get X, Y. From female, that is on sexual one, X, X. That is on sex chromosomes. But if it's an autosomal cell, it can be a heterogeneous. It can be, in a female, it can be X, small X. Or it can be double, uh, capital X, X, what we like. That is homogeneous or XX recessive, small x, those are recessive. So 50% from one, 50% from the other it comes. For if you can find out that lineage, then of course it is possible if you get the DNA database, if the uh, grandfather is alive or not. If you have the database, that is a very important thing, you have to have a control, a database. If you don't have it, then DNA testing as, is as good as nothing. Have you understood? Yes. What I understood from what you said, I don't know X, Y and all the scientific term, but what I could what I could, what I could understand is that from the result it is probable, it is it more is probable. probable. Yes. This is what probability cannot be ruled out. Yes. This is what that's I what we go to the court to say. I, I could not understand all the scientific terms though. <laughs> it lies on you. <laughs> Whether it can be ruled out or not, you have to find out from all the circumstances and from going for that. Thank you, ma'am. That's a very patent answer of mine. Probability cannot be ruled out. So I've just shed off the liability from my bag. Now it's a deciding officer who will decide the heading is. Anything else? One question. Um, like whenever 
Some sample is collected for DNA analysis. One of the grounds, you know, raised by the defense is that the sample was not properly collected and then the sample was contaminated. So are there any guidelines wherein like uh, as judicial officers we could like just cross check and then like well when that sample as i told you it has to be properly collected sealed packed and documented so if the chain of custody is maintained and that can be documented and proved by the forensic science expert that it ha it is that sample it is taken for granted that it is that sample if the chain is not broken anywhere say suppose this person has collected the police person has collected the sample and kept it somewhere and then later on got hold of the sample and gave it at times it happens to us they give us um, weapons they give us weapons which has been tampered with by the police department home department it has been tampered with by while packing it has been tampered with while collecting that weapon from the scene of crime or it has been tampered with by the medical doctors before coming to the scientific laboratory forensic science laboratory in that case there is every it becomes difficult for the scientist to find out whether there are any fingerprints or any blood stains or any other stains present over there which can link that weapon to that scene of crime except the injury and the description of the weapon it can be say if you use a knife and the knife the length of the knife and the depth of the stab wound size of the stab wound if it matches it can be matched then you can say this is probably that offending weapon in such cases yes that i told you the chain of custody has to be maintained and proved and documented if that cannot be done then yes there can be fallacy machine learning these are rather the same types of mechanisms or tools or systems it is nothing but this person whatever that artificial intelligence or machine learning comes it is a replica of the human being only that means before going into the details we use a very common artificial intelligence in our day to day life that is the mobile phone the google the future tools there are certain apps which we use for our daily day to day life and before we couldn't think about it but now it is going more and more in an advanced process now it is used robotic surgery robotic applications and procedures it is very much used in us uk in india it has already started to do robotic surgery in certain fields so artificial intelligence is nothing but it is a sort of procedure a system of robotics so these are the topics which i'll go in through through so it's a stimulation of human intelligence process by machines especially computer systems which we always use it's a set of technologies that enable computers to perform a variety of advanced functions including the ability to see understand the translated quotes translate spoken and written language analyze the data make recommendations and more studies the pattern of human brain and by analyzing the cognitive process it develops into intelligent software and systems these are all theoretical position things father of artificial intelligence is john mccarthy along with others then um the other people are the four names below that the three names below shaky was the first one the first general purpose mobile robot built according to the list of instructions 
the first uh, country now for artificial in the field of artificial intelligence is United States. We are far behind. And Dr. Pushpa Bhattacharya, IIT Bombay, was a renowned artificial intelligence professor in India. Charlie was the first artificial intelligence employee. And the first artificial intelligence is a female Western chimpanzee, acronym Kupri. Lexa is a conversational, conversational artificial intelligence interacting simply by conversation voice enabled devices just you order instruct them and that that person will act but what these things miss they miss one thing that is brain the neuron the brain of a human it has different parts gray matter white matter there's an axis in between and this brain has a peculiar function and that function is mental function, psychological function, emotional function. That part is missing in robots. You can create a number of robots, that is dolls, but you can't give the psychological emotional feeling into that person. So what will it will do? It will act as per order instruction fed into him or her. Whether it is right or wrong, he is not to decide as such. That was the beginning. But now, he started to analyze. He has started to find out what input he has been given and what he has to do. Just like a neutron bomb when it was created or an atom bomb when it was created. It was created for the benefit of the population, for the people. But later on, it is being used as a weapon of warfare. So both sides has a pro and con. Even artificial intelligence also. A robot has been built who killed its master. It happened. So it becomes, they become, uh, they don't have that psychology to act how it should. So this is the main difference between artificial intelligence and a human brain. A human brain can analyze to the point of righteousness, but an artificial intelligence software cannot do that. An algorithm is set of instructions we followed in calculations are the operations. This algorithm is nothing but, as I told you, there is now the name of the other one, that's Kupri. Just like that, they have the, they are being given certain names and certain Pre-fixed data and detailed instructions are fed into them and they act as per order. Machine learning and deep learning forms a core of artificial intelligence. So there are certain tools by which artificial intelligence can be, can act. And it is a joint initiative by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology National E-Governance Division also. As I told you, the first female robot in India was Robot Shalu, awarded by Janjosh.com for better innovation in science and for innovation in science and <coughs> technology by Education Minister of India. The famous AI was Geoffrey Hinton, the first dead from AI just now I told you. Robert Nicholas Williams, killed by the robot he has, he made. And here, first AI program in India at IIT Kharagpur was by Professor H.M. Mahabada. India ranks 32nd among 181 countries. The first is the US. These are all, this is a very important one which we use, I don't know whether you use or not, Chat GPT. Chat GPT is a tool. It's a future tool application. Tome is a future tool application, beta tome. And these are mainly used in production and marketing. But now we also use in our education and judiciary, in home, in every purpose, we use this just to record and maintain the databases, the functioning, quick functioning, 
without any risk or danger of going in the at the spot Margaret Masterman was a mother of AI father being as i told you this is a very important thing what is a principal artificial intelligence accountability inclusiveness reliability safety fairness transparency privacy security so you have to develop safe ethical responsible trusted and acceptable artificial intelligence software and the weakest type of artificial intelligence is facial image and recognition because that varies it, it can't fix up whether this person belongs to the same image that has been shown why today the picture it is shown to him after a few years the same picture won't be shown to him it won't be able to match the two pictures that person has aged so now this artificial in, uh, intelligence software might go against that same person which he has he or she has it has recognized so if you take the latest data large data set it starts from gestation of artificial intelligence in 1943 to birth of ai in 1956 to early enthusiasm great expectation 1942 to 69 to the uh, dose of reality 66 to 73 to knowledge based system 69 to 79 to artificial in, uh, intelligence becomes industry and is being used properly in 80s then return of neural network in 86 and finally the emergence of intelligent age in 1995 this is the process of emergence of the latest developed artificial intelligence which you find the fields of application text visual interactive analytic functional and the three that means these are the ways you can um set your artificial intelligence agent that is you can text him so he'll read those texts and act you can show pictures and act as such you can go on interacting with the artificial in that is giving directions time by time uh, at one time or the other so that if you give one instruction now and then tell him no you don't go there you go to the other that place you don't do this you do to that then you'll take up that direction which you are giving analytic this is a later one this artificial intelligence also whatever information is the instruction is given to him he is trying to analyze it and ultimately the functional what function that artificial ai has been built for then the three key elements are deep learning quantum computing big data deep learning means when that person is going to death and then acting quantum computing is the amount of data that is being fed feeded that's being fed that it also if it is small it does it quickly but it is huge it might get complex or per perplex or com confused and big data that is also the same thing that is if you give a huge data it becomes a bit difficult at this moment of artificial intelligence the utility these are all civil utilities over here two are important for us that is facial recognition and social media media is always a nuisance for us so we have to be aware of media so so too because what happens if you go in front they will take your picture so if you send someone in place of it to work for yourself then taking his or her picture has no value to you you are not good and uh, the other one was uh, facial recognition is the same as that your face is not recognized by the public by others the types are narrow ai general ai strong ai super intelligence we have reached up to strong ai 
That means Nadu means in a small field. The field is very small. Jaran means it a wider one. And the strong AI is a very intense and deep AI action. And super intelligence is one we are waiting for which will read human brain and act accordingly. Just there's no, there won't be any difference between human and an AI. But that is, has not yet arrived. Then other uh, types, reactive, limited memory, theory of mind, self-awareness. Reactive means he's seeing something and then he's acting accordingly because that's already been pre-fed with data and instructions. Limited memory, he has given a small amount of data to remember and act accordingly. Theory of mind, he has to some extent he can understand and analyze the fact and the actions and the people in front of him but not to the full, full extent. Here comes a biasness that he cannot read the psychology of the person. And self-awareness, that is nothing but he at times feels that he himself is that person. So he acts in that way. That he rather gets a superiority complex. Here comes the difficulty. Here, it can work in all direction fields and detect frauds, manage records, but it lacks emotional side and can do repetitive and time consuming tasks, can act without getting tired, non stopping, and can take risks because it won't get, won't have an effect on him. He's not a human, he's just a robot. So if anything happens to him, he will again dismantle and again remantle and again set. So it's no risk to him because he doesn't have the ability to analyze that he might be at risk. Disadvantages is harmful to society, privacy violation. If it enters in anyone's um, data, if it enters in anyone's household as and when it requires, if it enters in anyone's workplace, then there is a privacy violation. Automation. That means if someone believes in complete artificial intelligence, like before we didn't have any mobiles. So what we did? We worked with land phones. Then when the land phones were not there, didn't we communicate with others? Of course we did. We went to people's place. But nowadays going to people's place has stopped. We sit at home and talk over mobile, mobile and complete our things. So here also, if we find that we can get the same output from a machine, why take the uh, trouble to act one's own self? Save our time and go off to sleep. We have fed the machine and now he will act accordingly as per our instructions. Deep fakes, that means something you want to do which is not correct. It's a fraudulent, it's a fraudulent thing, it's a fraud, it's a fake. There, artificial AI can work. Algorithmic bias due to bad data. That means if the AI has been fed with not the correct, simple, true, beneficial data, but has been fed with wrong, purposefully wrong data, it will not have the same because it has no uh, capability of acting on its own. Whatever he is being input, giving input, his output, um, the output is the same. Input and output it tallies. If you give a bad data, his output will be bad. If you give a good data, his output, data, his output will be right. Like if a person has fallen sick, you cannot, as a doctor, you cannot go to that person's place. You tell the AI, just go and see what help that person needs. So he goes there, sees it, feeds you back. If the instructions set in her, in him, then he will act accordingly. But if you say, if you feel in this way, just see that some something is going wrong with it. If you find anything wrong going on, just kill him. 
It's a bad data. You go and just tell the AI to go and kill it. Whose responsibility is it? It is not your responsibility directly if it is not proved. It has to be proved that you have given the data and you are fed it to do it. Till now, law has no cause to give book an AI for an action which has been committed. In socio-economic inequality, those who can afford AI, they will be at a higher level, those who cannot afford will be at lower level. Like now, of course, mobile everyone has, but other gadgets, other like computers, like uh, digital, say in operations only, if you go in for a open surgery, I'm going for a laboratory surgery. So those who can afford for an open surgery will afford that. Those who can't afford for a laboratory they go for an open surgery. This is the difference. Similarly, here also there is a bias, socio-economic bias. Weapons optimization, that is, if that person, that is, that is the same as I have told before, that is it becomes, uh, whatever you feed to that person, that AI will act accordingly, so it can act as a dangerous weapon also to go and carry out your instructions. Cost incurred in maintenance repair. This is a fallacy. Lack human touch. There is no brain. There is no psychology, mental property over there. Lack a creative mind. He can't think and create something for the solution of a problem. He will do as he has said. Lack common sense. That if he goes over there and sees that uh, just the room is dark. But he has not been fair to say that switch on the put the switch on and the room will be lighted. So he goes there, finds darkness, he comes out. But he doesn't have the common sense to switch. Put the switch on. This is this deficiency he has. That means whatever data he is fixed, he'll act accordingly. Abilities of human may be diminished. That means the function of human, the importance of human doesn't, goes gradually, decreases. He is becoming more and more dependent on the AIs. So if you, even in this one say, if you have to make a PPT, if you go for chat GPT and Tome and all those, you can easily create this. You just write something and it will create a PPT. Whether it is relevant for that or not, done, you have taken the help of future tools, the artificial intelligence. Wrong hands can cause destruction, as I have told you, at bumps like that. If that artificial intelligence robot falls in a form, in a wrong hand, instead of doing benefit for people, multitude in operation, it can do even removal of some organ. If for going for a kidney transplant, proper, just to save the life, you can remove the kidney and not transplant. And AI is completely based on preloaded data. Challenges, computing power, tolerance power, intuitive thinking, judging power. This I've already said, it has no function, no hand in its own action. It will only act as he, is, he has been told. <coughs> this I've, uh, the later portions also have said that A and I, we have reached AGI, that is narrow intelligence, we have reached. General intelligence will reach in future, it is in process. Strong intelligence at places they have reached, but superhuman, then I don't know what will happen because men will not be, man will not be required at all. Importance, it enables human capabilities, understanding, reasoning, planning, communication, perception. If all depends upon the data that has been fed. And of course, it is cost effective. Once you build an AI, then the effect, you don't have to spend more money on it. You can of course uh, modernize and advance it. But money exp expenditure will be decreased and also 
See, if you have to go from one place to the other, just to deliver a, an information, then the cost which you have to bear in such a hot climate, the eye doesn't need that. They'll just take, board a bus and go. But you might need a cab, an AC cab, and that is expense. Basic concepts are categorization, classification, machine learning, collaborative filtering. Categorization means the eye has to be categorized for a particular function. If it is used for surgery, it is categorized for surgical. If it is used for marketing, it is categorized for marketing. If it is used for judiciary, it has to be categorized for judiciary. If it is used for home department, it has to be categorized for that. For different departments, it has to be categorized. If you feed it to with the big data, everything, it will just jumble it up, mix up. This is the same as classification. You classify it into ANI, AGI, or strong or superhuman. Machine learning is nothing different, but its function is similar as that of AI. That is, machine is those instruments or gadgets which you use for to act as artificial intelligence. Starting from the mobile to the digital 3D versions, digital microscopes or telescopes, etc. Collaborative filtering, that is two AIs has been given two tasks. They have similar, some parts in common. Yeah, they can filter it and they will act accordingly. They, are, they will divide it amongst themselves. So these are the functions of AI, natural language generation, that is when while communicating, that person will speak in the language the others can understand. And even he is fed in that language which others can understand. If there are two or three languages that is in vogue at a place, then those three languages this person will know. So if someone who doesn't know Bengali comes over there, then that person will not speak Bengali, that will speak in their mother tongue, if possible. Speech recognition. That is, uh, this is quite evident from itself. That is, that AI will recognize speech he is uh, acquainted with. Like the pets, the birds, they recognize the speeches of their master. Similarly here also. There should be a platform for machine learning. That is, the infrastructure should be there for learning from the machines. For the robotics, for the action of the robotics, there should be a proper space, proper place, proper instruments, proper gadgets, by which you can function with that AI. Because that, this is nothing but an electronic device. And if it doesn't remain cool and cold, it might not function properly, it might function erratically. So, the atmosphere has to be suitable for its functioning. Decision management, AI optimized hardware, deep learning platforms and robotic process automation. These are things which have to be present in the place. The stages of AI, it is to collect data analysis, collection, cleaning, exploration, modeling, evaluation, interpretation, system production, maintenance. Starting from the data which has been fed, it has to collect all those data at the place of where it is sent. It has to analyze the data according to the software it has been put and then you will filter those data and act according to the situation that whole thing has been fed into him and according to that his output will be there. The goals are logic and problem solving, knowledgeable engineering, planning, machine learning, social intelligence, computing, creativity, general intelligence, where creativity is still not there. He can't create anything. He can't think. He can't do anything as on its own. He has to act as a servant of his, of his creator. What the creator had in mind, he is acting accordingly. Evolution of AI from the rule-based system, context awareness and retention, domain-specific expertise, reasoning machine self-awareness system, 
This was I was talking about artificial super intelligence or singularity. That means that person becomes himself the human, just like a human or just like his creator, and acts as a single person and transcends. The importance is forms the basis of all computer learning and is the future of all complex decision making. That is, whatever you want to do, you are doing in a detailed process. If when you didn't have a computer, what you did? You wrote it in manually? You did the things manually? But now, once you have the computer, you just try to copy-paste, find out the shapes and diagrams, and paste over there. Then, uh, from internet and web search, you get the, the things located, and you put them in the computer, feed it. So that you can save it at a place and later on when it is needed you can utilize that. So here also this is needed and ultimately when it collects all the data the output it gives when it, a decision has to be made. So there are two scientific methods, hidden Markov models and Bayesian network. This based hidden Markov is based on rigorous mathematical theory. There is a big mathematical calculation behind it, which is the output of the AI. And the efficient representation and rigorous reasoning with uncertain knowledge. That is, he represents well with reasoning, but his knowledge is not that much sufficient. So it becomes a not, the output is not accurate. That is bias in network. These are the fields where AI works. That is in, for MPs, for NGOs, for courts, for experts, for public, and for all the other sectors, AI works in different ways. And in every place, there is e-computation uh, e and e-processes. Internet has already become the principal source of legal cognition for citizens, as I told you just now. The main source of information for, not only for lawyers, but for everyone. Uh, previously, existing legal system moving into internet, new sources of legal information emerging, and a legal web emerging, a part of broader worldwide web. Just I'll tell you uh, over here, when before in 2002, when I went to court, I found that there's a stenographer, or rather a typist, not a uh, computer operator, and the judiciary, whatever happened, there was not an AC room, but it was hot, humid, not even enough chairs and etc. So the typist went, in, went on typing the, all the statements and record everything. Slowly, that changed over to a computerized recording and easy printout of the statement so that the witness didn't have to wait and it is disposed very quickly. So what happened? Later on, if the typist is absent, the presiding officer, he or she only acted as a, took that part over. He didn't uh, wait for a typist or someone to come over. He might, there might be a shortage of staff, but the case has to be channelized quickly. So he is taking up the part. So the computer has facilitated him from waiting for a long time. And the case is disposed very quickly. And this is also done by keeping a data, a record. Once you find out, you search in the computer for a particular case, you can just open it. And later on, if a date falls, then you can just go through it. You will know at once what happened in the previous date. So this also minimizes the time of disposal of that case. You don't have, there's no delay of time. So this is what I'm saying that AI has lessened the consumption of time, the easy accessibility, 
this we also all need the facilities which are required if you require that woman to go through certain case laws or something instead of searching over the flick over the so many books you just give a put a information and you will get it in the computer everything is registered there so there is a database a data bank which diminishes time and also manpower so much manpower is not required the global society for legislative authorities to share documents and information that is also need, uh, helpful you want to share if a case has occurred in your court and you want to share it in with if I, it has been switched over to a higher court and you want the documents what has happened over there you don't have it in the cd so what do you do you can share it swiftly online by mailing it for that you don't have to delay you don't have to say oh come over after one month or two months those are fast track uh, cases this helps to own all to learn from others experience in order to frame legal provisions if certain important exciting very complicated case has taken place in your court then that case you can easily share so many cases come to you you can't remember all the details of all you can just remember the titles but when it is put in a record form somewhere you can easily share it to others and you can take from others also you can take the informations or their experience very quickly so this sharing of experience sharing of knowledge sharing of ideas sharing of your method of action which is more beneficial to the public that can be done very quickly so that legal informatics be data based to support legal activities creation cognition application of law you can create law you can recognize law and you can apply it as suitable to that particular situation so legal informatics expanding from mathematics calculation data management to office automation to telecommunication to global knowledge infra infrastructure so at first you have to sit over there and just calculate the things write it down manually then it went on to management of the data because there is a data bank then it went on to give it to the subordinates to the office uh, staffs they will help you in retrieving the data and furnish them quickly and if you need any help from someone immediately you can call him up call some that person up and get the communication from them that is relevant to your case and of course there is a database there is a data bank so you have all the informations in the data bank which you which the world might need it's a global infrastructure data and on that you can improve your knowledge and your experience so these are the uh suggestions integration automation provision of new tools these are for reengineering processes for rationalizing your workflow if you are if you if you have a bias if you are confused whether what action you are taking is correct or not this you can change and rational put in a rational pathway from seeing the other cases or other experiences in the database and occasion to adopt advanced technologies for managing legal information one thing in our one thing in our non uh, thing i tell you there are in medicine now there are certain ai applications one as i told you robotic surgeries instead of a person doing it they give the robots to do the operations feeding the data how they can do it there there is a minimization of contact minimization uh, there is a uh, increase in um asepsis asepsis that means infection can be diminished thirdly precisement of the operation if you have if you are doing it yourself you might jetta you might Uh, data in doing that will i go there say a gall bladder of a chronic days of old for some years 
it has got adhering to the surrounding muscles and tissues. And you are fearing when you will go to the root, to the base. <coughs> will you cut the hepatic artery on cystic duct or not? But the eye doesn't have that sense. He has been told to operate, follow this process, he will go without fear. This fear section in human is a very bad thing. This fear uh, emotion, fear quality. This prevents us to do a lot of things. If you go up in the climb a mountain, high up in the mountain, and look down, you are afraid of jumping, even you have a parachute. You're just doing a mountaineering, just going down. You're afraid, fear. If you go up out in the darkness, you have to go home late at night. You're afraid of the night, of the darkness. You're fear. So these can be annulled with AI because they don't have that emotion. Another one is in forensics, autopsies are being done, virtual autopsy. 3D autopsy. There, I don't know whether you have anyone uh, watched that. There's a room which has all the gadgets over there. The body is lying over there. And the person, the autopsy surgeon is outside the room. And just with the help of these certain AIs and certain computer techniques, laser rays and other rays are being passed through the body to focus some pictures and from that you can arrive at some conclusion without entering the autopsy room. You are dissecting, not dissecting but virtually dissecting, not cutting open the body. This is 3D autopsy which is being followed now. It is already opened in Chandigarh for autopsy and soon to open at Ames, Delhi. So a conscious AI cannot be con uh, constructed without knowing what exactly the conscious is. That is, he doesn't have any conscious. So how can he act? Without this cognitive continuum, AI has no comprehensive view of thought. It has to ignore some comprehensive thought modes, dreaming or free association. It is not a human being. It has no emotions. It cannot associate between the two. Between two actions, two reactions, two people, nothing. It can't dream of anything. If I do this, it will be better. If I do that, it will be better. It only has to act as he has been fed with the data. It's uncertain how to integrate emotional thought. As I told you, not creative. Scientists have to mathematically simulate human thought process. This is what where the scientists come into action. He feeds the data for a particular action from his own knowledge and capabilities and that data is fed into the AI and the AI acts accordingly. But human brain, it relies on different neurons and axons and neural network and if you do something wrong and you're conscious of it, your sympathetic activity level, it rises. You get afraid, you start perspiring, you get hot, you feel hot, you will just shake, you won't, you will Think twice before going forward. And if you are doing everything right, then you are cool and calm. Of course, this differs in certain cases who are cold, cold blooded murderers. They have no action, no reaction. They just go forward and commit the murder. Here, the psychological portion is defective. They are psychopaths. They don't have that thing. They are like, if you don't have uh, chilies, you can't Take it, you can accept it. But the food is highly spicy. If you go on taking food first day, you won't be able to. Second day, you will be tears will start uh, dribbling. Going on and on, one day you are acclimatized to it. And that chili, even one chili you couldn't take, then you are taking 10 chili spiced food. This is acclimatization happens. In our places, one who enters an autopsy room is highly obnoxious, the smell. But after staying there for a few minutes, if it's a decomposed body, no problem. You can go in because you are acclimatized to the smell. 
the police person they put the handkerchiefs on their face they can't but they have to see the case these are the softwares which i was talking about mobile phones video game characters gps gps is highly used in cars and everywhere voice recognition this is also we do google assistant we speak even those voice recorders voice call recorders uh, robotics virtual autopsy 3d autopsy google or web chat gpt and other innumerable feature tools so what is intelligence how to react a learning thinking mind with technology according to david galenter galenter a yale professor ai is lost in the woods he is just against it he says how can a human brain act how can ai act as like a human it is a just a machine yes it is a machine but at the present moment it is limited in its action but day will come the ai from narrow intelligence to general intelligence to strong intelligence is going on on over to super intelligence and that time the importance or use utility of men of human beings will be diminished and these will take an upper hand and will start working because his concept is whole brain mapping and recreating through neuro imaging is required which ai doesn't have a brain itself how can it act but as i told you rapid advancement in this is taking place what a next chapter is this are just uh, like through ai and machine learning these are key technologies as i already told you and these can lead to a more efficient justice delivery system without the using one zone brain you can depend upon the artificial intelligence to reduce your time to hasten your disposal of cases these are required in various aspects of forensic analysis including dna profiling fingerprint analysis facial recognition and voice analysis now how far this is acceptable to judiciary that is a question of the time whether judiciary will accept ai this is still not this is still in the debate stage voice recognition does judiciary accept a recording of voice over mobile i don't think so it has to be matched and matching is a long process still i don't think it's acceptable secondly does judiciary accept whatsapp messages no why yes someone else could have whatsapp from that person's mobile who can say that this is a her mom message it's very difficult so ai also is at the level of judicial acceptance and this rests upon the judiciary to form regulations to make it acceptable and if it is done that is such bills if they can be made and can be passed then of course these laws would help a lot in modernization of our society because of such a huge population is difficult to manage all facets of life in order to live a smooth and enjoyable one these technologies can help forensic experts identify suspects more accurately and quickly which can lead to faster resolution of cases as i have told till now more efficient justice delivery now at the scene of crime ai has a lot to help it helps in taking in collecting evidences it helps in matching them at the spot it helps in finding out any untraced bullets like in uh, when we find gunshot injuries multiple entrance multiple exit it's in a recently i've done two cases one in a decomposed body the other one in a fresh body multiple entrances multiple exits exit no information not at all from any side of the police be it local inquiry be it uh, appearing as a same 
because he was wearing a uh, apparel so the apparel has taken over the tattoo marks the burning and singeing it has been fired from a distance um while riding a bicycle uh, at a distance the second they don't know in the kolkata hospital they had done laparotomy they had done um, chest drain abdomen drain they had repaired certain fractures etc but when i went to the operation i didn't have any catches i didn't have an electronic detector metal detector i didn't have any extra facility i just can't find two bullets i found only two bullets one from pistol the other one from revolver and at least two i can match they have been true and true the other two they are writing in ct that is ai they are writing in uh, mri they are writing in x ray that these are the places where the bullets has been lodged one in paraspinal muscles that is beside the vertebra on the right side the other one is in the chest fracturing the ribs but there there was a drain a stitch up wound so when that opened they have opened the abdomen to repair to undergo surgical repair but they couldn't because of the deterioration the the condition of the person was deteriorating so when i didn't find i just i don't know what i did i just slice it into so many pieces which is against which is violation of human rights i had no option it was a morbid in body i had no option i have to find out so what to do i didn't find the other two bullets so the only possible outcome is while stitching up or placing the over here in the chest and the bullet was supposed to fracture one of the ribs over there very close to it they must have it's a very small revolver bullet this much must have got lost secondly the paraspinal muscle fractured the transverse process and while sucking out the during laparotomy while sucking it out it must have got lost that's why i didn't get it but who is going to face a court i have to face a court and i have to tell them and it was profuse blood clotted and fluid <coughs> so while i was doing the autopsy i also had to remove the blood it was so small bullet the rifle bullet was uh, the revolver a pistol bullet was okay but the small bullet revolver bullet where to get from it's very difficult to say second one was one month the person lived <coughs> three weeks in jamshed court they didn't didn't do anything <coughs> except again a laparotomy one week over here they didn't do anything here also we didn't find a single bullet not a single bullet yet there was six firing there was a team of doctors six firing so you can understand while taking out while going for laparotomy or while we went for this this is a new body of course but we didn't find any bullet what we found yes we can stand we found several marks tattoo marks and that is known as bullet fouling that is a bullet has broken down and just those parts are stuck over there and those make certain pellet like things pellet like a uh, feature and that's known as bullet fouling so if we had my whole thing was just because if we had proper ai help we could have found it we didn't have to open up the body we could have found it through virtual autopsy but that is still to be in over here so despite the challenges and the limitations ai is still one tool which we need and the reliability on it depends upon the advancement the accuracy of its technology and the sensitivity precision of its analysis and output the future directions are 
In medical science, forensic science looks promising with ongoing research and development in areas such as predictive analytics, automated decision making, and real time monitoring. These are nothing but medical jargons. Uh, that means a medical personnel has to analyze it, find it, collect the data, analyze it, and by um, proper, sorry, proper reasoning has to come to a decision. As these technologies continue to evolve, they have the potential to transform the way we investigate crimes and deliver justice, leading to a more efficient and effective judicial justice system. In conclusion, we can also say that now the AI is a very good tool, but whether, as I told you before, it is acceptable to the judiciary has depends upon the rules and regulations of acceptance and that will take some time. But certain parts are accepted and those parts are close it. Has to be accepted as the rules say. Oh, I don't take tea. I don't take tea at all. I take coffee. Yes, sir. And uh, that is mainly for the purpose of uh, special interpretation of judgments, the, uh, the, the previous judgments which are there, as well as uh, the current one, the current judgments, or anything that happens in the court in the vernacular language. That is one of the prime objectives. Another one is also for sort of, in fact, uh, recently a Punjab High Court used AI to pass a bill order. So, in those ways, we are using AI. Listen, no. Listen, we are using Listen. AI. So, the court is very much into AI. We are but it's still at It's position. still in the initial stage, in the process. Well, for Roto, that is Thuar, tissue, human tissue transplantation. Organ Transplantation Act that's led into a national sub, sub committees like and depending on that into NOTO, SOTO, ROTO. NOTO is National Organ and Tissue Transplantation Act and Tissue Transplantation Organization and ROTO is Regional Organ and Tissue Transplantation Organization. Of ROTO I had taken a It's a, a roto. I've taken a certificate uh, course from the government of India, uh, sorry, government of West Bengal, and one of the nodal officers. So, at present, it is said that the IPG MER in Kolkata is a scheme. This roto is taking place. Actually, it is not. It is a system that is certain formalities have to be followed. And that's formality is the same for Noto Soto Roto. It's only the level which is differs. Just like the trial courts and sessions court, that is uh, magistrate courts and sessions court and appellate courts, if you have to pass the capital punishment, you take the permission of the Supreme Court and as such. Similarly, here also, if you have to pass, do anything at the regional level, you have to take the permission of the NOTO, that is national level. So that comes through government and government has certain protocols and government has laid certain uh, formulations, a lot of formulations, a lot of protocols which are very difficult to follow. Now this um, why this Organ and Tissue Transplantation Act is very important? Because before, these people, what was they doing? They used, just like the other cases, there's a pros and cons. So the pros are, organ, someone's organ is, this is I'm not showing this slide, I'm just telling it first, then I'll go through. Someone's organ is 
deceased, inactive, not functional, and he has to take, he has to get an organ. And mostly these organs, two important organs are kidney and cornea. But what they used to do before, they used to take the purchase organ from anyone. This led to two things. One, graft <laughs> rejection, organ rejection. Second, a huge expenditure. Both of them fall under an offence. Means, if they take it illegally from other persons, not following the protocols, it is an offence, it's a crime and is punishable. And any doctor doing such a thing is punished by imprisonment and fine up to 20 lakhs. So, they have formulated a committee and in that committee they have kept an authorizing committee and an acceptance committee and they made the formulations and they pass a uh, guideline for organ retrieval, organ donation, organ transplantation. So pros are, the advantages are the person, these organs are life saving for the person. They are dying. These persons are dying. The donor is also dying. There are two things. One is a donor, the other one is a recipient. The donor is dying. So if he gets an organ from somewhere, if he has the capacity to buy it, he's doing it. But this has gone to such an extent, this person is being exploited. Large, huge amount of money is being demanded for an organ. Might be due to economic crisis or might be due to professional income. So, economic crisis means it's a poor patient, poor subject, poor donor. He, he thinks, if I can donate one of my kidneys, what's the harm? The other kidney is functional. But he has not gone through any medical checkup to see whether his other kidney is functional or not. That, function, that kidney might be damaged also or might be in the process of damage. So ultimately, in lieu of a large amount of money, he has donated one of his kidneys. And he has, in due course of time, his other kidney got damaged and he died. So ultimately the result is big zero. Might be his family might uh, be uh, in gain, but ultimately the result is big zero. And the other process is the medical professionals, the agents, just to gain some money, just to manage some money, they use liver, of course you must be knowing kidney rackets, several places, kidney rackets. And several has been arrested for it also. Hospitals has been shut down, nursing homes has been shut down. So that is a very large criminal office, offense. So when we take these two balances, the government thought that why not formulate some guidelines for this organ transplantation. So first it was taken as Human Tissue and Organ Act and then it later changed over to this Noto, Soto and Roto. Now, first of all, uh, the tissues which are which can be donated are one we donate at random, one tissue we donate at random and that is blood. That is also a tissue. We donate blood at random. We donate bone marrow at random in carcinomatous patients, in cancer patients or in patients who require blood. We don't think about it. Might be that patient is not suitable for donation. Might be that person is suffering from anemia. Might be at extremes of ages. Might be suffering from diseases, incurable diseases. Still, that person is donating without, some, at times without knowing, at times with knowing, for their personal gains. Secondly, what we donate are kidney, liver, lungs, brain, pancreas, small intestine, stomach, bone, 
hair, skin. Skin is very important in plastic surgery. Small intestine is very important in plastic surgery. So, uh, even at places it's written urine and feces. I don't know what for. Anyway, feces and uh, urine, not feces, semen, sorry. Sorry, urine and semen. I don't know. Semen has to be for in vitro fertilization and the artificial fertilization reproduction. Yeah. Not fecal, not fecal. Gut. That is for plastic surgery operations to join the two things. That is it. Pancreas also for insulin deficient subjects. Pancreas can be transplanted. Liver has a high brain also. Liver has a high capacity for regeneration. If you cut your own liver into a little portions removed, then it will regenerate to form the full thing. Liver has a very good uh, problems capability. So, this donation is done depending upon one main factor, and that is brain stem death. Brain death. If the person is brain dead, brain stem dead rather, brain dead has two parts. One is somatic, the other one is molecular. And the molecular falls brain dead and brain stem dead. Brain stem is nothing but the midbrain, the medulla portion. The midbrain portion and the medulla portion. The stem of the brain is medulla and below. So, midbrain, medulla and below. Now, to find that out, law has in the book, they have written two death certificates have to be given at an interval of six hours. But there are organs which become useless after six hours or rather its importance decreases after six hours. They are heart, liver, these within four to six hours, within four hours heart, four to six hours. If properly kept, it has to be kept properly. Cornea, as delay as you may, that is, it should be within two hours. If you delay it to six hours, even up to 24 hours or 48 hours, you can. If you preserve it properly, even after 15 days, you can. But as early as you can, donate. You can uh, transplant. Then, uh, another one is um, brain donation usually it is rejected. Now this donation falls under matching. You have to match the donors and the recipients certain blood vitals, certain vitals. One of them is image C, histocompatibility. The other one is whether it is HIV negative. Then the chromosomal stage at times they do it. Otherwise graph rejection is very high. Whether that person is immunosuppressed, that means that immunity of that person is very low, then that graft will be rejected. So, these cases you have to uh, segregate or filter according to the uh, feasibility, according to facility. And for this donation, there are certain regulations. Second one is informed consent. You have to be very careful whether that person has given consent or not. And it should be informed consent. Not a verbal one. Not an express consent. But it should be informed. He should, he or she should be made to understand why he is donating, what for he is donating whether he or she is capable of donating or not. And there are certain stages where consent, informed consent cannot be given. That is, if the person is a minor, that person herself, himself cannot give. Someone else has to give on her or his, uh, in lieu of his or her. That is, parents or authorized legal person or next of kin. Donate donors can be of two types. One, a living donor. Second one is a cadaver, dead body donor. 
So living donor, for dead body donor, it is two things. One, before death, if that person has already given a consent, filled up a consent form and submitted. For that, but after death, there are again two things. One, the next of kin has the right either to donate, allow to donate or to reject donation. Even if he has given consent, the next of kin might not want to. He has all a right to refuse. And if not, then the person, the near relative, the next of kin or an authorized person, person authorized by him before his death, that person can give the consent, informed consent. In a living donor, it always happens, blood donation, cornea donation, kidney donation, they do it. And that they can do themselves. But if that person is a minor, below 18 years, then that person has to, the informed consent has to be taken from the parents, the guardians, or again the legal guardians, authorized person. Now this recipient and donor, both of them have to undergo certain tests, medical tests, to find out the compatibility. If it is compatible, then only they can donate. Otherwise, once that donation, don uh, donating organ goes to the data bank, it is retrieved from the body and then put in a data bank. Once it goes in the data bank, they will just try to match the possible first come, first served or the person who requires the organ more, whose urgency is more. In that way, they try to select and they try to match that with the different people. If they can find a match, then at once they go in for the donation. For donating the organ, there is no cost from the part, on the part of the donor. For recipient, they have to pay some cost and that cost unofficially is not very little. But officially, that cost is very little. So, apart from that, the first thing I told, the doctor has to certify. Now that certification time has come down to one hour because of this loss of the organ. Of course, there should be a confirmed certification. Not just often they are giving yes, yes, that, because there is a term called suspended animation. Suspended animation means the person appears to be dead, but he is not, he or she is not dead. Like in electrocution, in athletes, in yogas, or in very severe anemia, or very in a sh shocked condition. This person appears that they are there, all the vitals have become so low that they cannot, they appear to be dead. But when you go in for ECG or EEG, you find that there are tracings coming away. That means the person is living, alive. So in case, just to avoid suspended animation, suspended animation occurs actually within one to two hours. After that, in very few cases, recovery is after one to two hours. Otherwise, the suspended animation, it stays till two hours at times. I want to be talking about that. So, brain dead, there are certain forms that has to be filled up. For MCCD, that is medical certification of cause of death, you need to fill up the form number 4. 41, 42, 4, 4A, 4, 1A, 1B, 1C, according to the case. And, there are two other forms which has been filled up before retrieval of the organ, form 8 and form 10. One Form 10 is for the review committee that this organ is being, the application to review committee where this organ is being retrieved. The cause, the need, everything and the signature and the consent will be there. And form 8 is the informed consent of the applicant and what organs are being retrieved. So 
these things, if you find there, okay. And secondly, if there should be, it should be, first of all, depending on the application, they have to go to the organ retrieval committee. And that person will give a written, written permission for organ retrieval. And then insert in, this organ can be retrieved. But where? Anywhere. No, not anywhere. You can retrieve an uh, cornea even at home or any nursing home if proper aseptic condition is there but you can't retrieve everything in that way if the person is dead you can't retrieve the organ from that dead person at home it has to be retrieved at a proper place proper infrastructure and that proper infrastructure should be a mortuary infrastructure an infrastructure having a proper clean um, properly maintained mortuary and the person who is retrieving the organ is also trained. But in our place, apart from the mortuary, there are certain hospitals and nursing homes who are assigned, who are given the right to retrieve the organs and call the autopsy surgeons to go and do the autopsy over there, post-mortem over there. That is, the, these surgeons, they retrieve the organ at the normal operation theatre, sealed, packed, labelled and kept in abeyance properly so that they can transfer it to the donor, to the recipient at when and where needed according to the data bank over there also. Here also the data bank comes. That is, they have filed applications, we find huge numbers of applications who need the organ and according to that, after retrieval of the organ, these person call the, means before they have already notified the home department, the police person, the jurisdictional police station to uh, arrange for autopsy. Say a road traffic accident has come. A patient died in road traffic accident. He has already before death, he has already filled up the form of organ donation. So, if it's next to kin or the legal heirs, they want to desire it, then the organs has to be retrieved. So, here comes two situations. One, where the retrieval of the organ is required very quickly and has to be passed to green corridor. That means without non-stop, without loss of time, that has to be passed from the place of retrieval to the place of donation. That's the green corridor. That means there will, no, there will be no traffic crowd, traffic jam. It will go through. Secondly, that person, that place where the organ is retrieved, the body is opened. So why? stitch it up and again send it to another government mortuary for autopsy. Call the doctor, autopsy surgeon. How it is done? They apply to the higher authority and the higher authority means the government of the authority. Ours is Shastu Harun. From there, the special secretary Mert is a local cent uh, central nodal officer of Roto. He signs a document that this organ can be retrieved NCCD has been followed according to the form, form 8, form 10, they have been uh, submitted. Now you arrange for post-mortem examination of this body from whom the organ has been retrieved. So the autopsy surgeon then goes there and does the post-mortem and dispose of the body. Here it states two things, one, the transport of the retrieved body delays the time consumed for disposal and also along with it cost effectiveness. But what I am saying all these, these all fall under rules and regulations. Any violation of law in the process of organ donation, organ retrieval, organ transplant or autopsy or anything, if the infrastructure is not appropriate, 
if that place, because that OT, private OT is being used for other operations. Now, if that place is not properly uh, disinfected after autopsy, then that will again violate the human rights. Because next person who is operated over there, that person will might get infection. That is iatrogenic infection. So that is also violating human rights. That has to be made sepsis free. This is a very tedious process, yet it is followed at places due to the uh, crisis of scarcity of time. And at times, high profile cases, they don't follow any rules and regulations, they have to have the body immediately. So there you have to go. Apart from that, there are other loopholes. Here are also cons are there. And those cons are accruement of money, money laundering. Now, this is very difficult to prove. Here, if the judiciary comes into effect, action, there will be no one to say, yes, they have taken so much money. Who will prove, say? Even if the recipient asks them, they will not say. Because they want the organ. If they say, they won't get the organ. Another thing is very important. This one has to look into. This is also, if any complaint goes because of this, in this regard, that is, when has a person died and when has the organ retrieved? At times we find the person is in ventilator. Already brain death has occurred. But the family people doesn't want to wean the person out of the ventilator. They are psychologically upset. They feel that he is on he or she is on ventilator. My revive. Why wean that person off? They are keeping hopes. But by that time, when they agree to give the organ, time lapses happen and the organ is already useless. Here comes, if the recipient somehow comes to know and lodges a case regarding it because they are spending a lot of money. So he is being, he is spending the money, money gone. He is taking the organ, organ graft, organ rejection. So what has he got? Ultimately that patient might, might have succumbed, died. What has he got? Nothing. So a case can be filed over here. This is a portion of our venue. That we have to keep in mind certain things. One, brain death has been confirmed. Number two, informed consent. Number three, donor and recipient match each other in profile, vitals. Number four, there is no pressure in donation. There is no pressure of money expenses. Number five, all the protocols, all the rules and regulations have been properly followed. Number six, the infrastructure where the Autopsy is being carried out in unnatural death cases. So I'm not talking about the natural ones where the organs are just taken and autopsy is not done. Say a cardiac arrest patient on treatment suddenly dies in the hospital and a natural death certificate has been given for that. So there won't be any autopsy. So in that case, if the person has already donated his, filled out the form for donation before his death, then in that case, the person, uh, here, there is no question of retrieval of the organ, no question, there is question of retrieval of the organ, but no question of autopsy, so not in that case. But in unnatural death cases, where these people are, uh, have died in unnatural, any unnatural death, like RTA, RRA, a railroad accident, or any burn cases within seven years of marriage or otherwise, then any uh, assault case, any rape case, any murder case of course. Now here or any other cases, homicide, suicide. So in uh, all these cases you have to 
analyze whether this person is befitting for organ donation or not. He has said, yes, I'll donate organ. At the age of 21, he has said, I'll donate organ. But at the age of 51, you find that he's suffering from diabetes, suffering from hypertension, suffering from hypercholesterolemia, etc., etc., and that organ is useless. You can't take the organ. So those has to be matched. If the age is more than 70 years, you can't take the organ from such a person. If the person is otherwise disabled due to uh, dangerous or fatal diseases like carcinoma, you can't take the organ. Even in stage 1 breast cancer or prostate cancer, you can't take the organ. If the blood, if he has a hemolytic cancer, blood cancer, you can't take the organ. It can develop later on, not before. So you can't take those organs. So these are the places, any cases, as such, the role of the judiciary is whether proper protocols are being maintained, starting from the filling up of the forms to the informed consent to organ donation, infrastructure, etc. Number two, whether there is no, whether any case has not been lodged uh, relating regarding the extra extraction of money from the recipient. Thirdly, whether just because of money or other reasons, a uh, defunct organ is being given to the recipient or not. Number four, if the infrastructure protocols are not followed, then whether it has gone against human rights for the others. These can be the points where, places where a judiciary comes into function once they are notified. Otherwise, they have no place to enter into this. So, organ donation and transplantation of medical procedures which is, uh, involve the transfer, transfer of organs from one person to another. It, these procedures have the potential to save life and improve the quality of life, but there are medical and eth ethical and legal aspects which has to be taken into consideration. These are the organs which can, you can transfer, heart, lungs, <coughs> kidney, liver, pancreas, intestine, stomach, testes, Hand, even the hand can be transplanted. If someone has lost a portion of hand, but say the right hand and he becomes jobless, functionless, then someone else whose hand is intact but has died due to accident just then, you can, if he has already uh, consented for organ transplantation, that hand can be grafted, plastic surgery by plastic surgery. Cornier, skin, islands of Langerhans are nothing but the pancreas has the cells which develop insulin, glucagon, they are required for that. Bone marrow, heart valves can also be transferred. Bone, blood, hair. Hair transplant is just due to cosmetic value. Types of transplant can be autologous or autograph. This was a violation they used to make. That is, anyone is taking organs from anyone. There is no blood relation, nothing. That is heterologous. There is no violation, uh, no uh, relation, or rather heterogeneous. Not heterologous, but heterogeneous. That is, this law has banned this transfer. It is emphasizing on autographed, autologous transfer. It is the same person. The person is transferring from the family relationship and transferring to another one. Xenograft is from animals and synthetic skin substitutes are there. Types of donor I have already said, living and uh, cadaver. That is formation of state level donation committee to streamline projects. Already these have been formed. 
SOP, Standard Operating Procedure, Operation Procedure for Declaration to Transplant, that is Form 10. Common Waiting List of Patients, you have to find out the list of patients who have uh, submitted applications for receiving, receiving organs. But there also the doctor has to, well, not according to his bias, but according to the benefit of the patient, has to select, filter, who needs the organ urgently and who can wait. Secondly, the matching of the two patients is there or not. In proper unbiased format, and all centers should work as a common group, that is, the medical personnel, the authorities, the recipient, the donors, and the judiciary, they should all act accordingly, according to all the logistics which are required. This is Form 4, MCCD, Medical Certificate for Cause of Death. Form 6, for Spousal Living Donor. Form 7, for Organ of Tissue Pledging, that you have already agreed to give your organ while you are alive. Form 8 for declaration come consent and Form 10 application approval of or for transplantation or life donor in case of life donor. So while you are going for an organ transplantation process, you have to see that all these forms are there along with the letter from the government authorizing you to take the, to retrieve the organ or to transplant it. The legal aspects are organ donation and transplantation. Legal aspects vary from country to country. In some countries, organ donation is voluntary and requires a consent of the donor or the family. But in other countries, organ donation is mandatory unless individual opts out. That is, there is a crisis of organ, person needs organ, and this person needs money. You have to, it's matters, you have to give the organ. It becomes mandatory, it's a rather a pressure, not in our country. In addition to laws surrounding organ donation, there are also laws regarding the allocation of organs and the transplantation process. These laws aim to ensure fairness and equity in the distribution of organs. This is about what I've told you, about Thoa and all those. The ethical consideration of organ transplant and donation plays a significant role. Main ethical issue is a concept of informed consent, just now as I've told you. You have to take in a written consent from it, expressing, informing them all the hazards and the benefits and everything, the detailed process, procedure of the organ transplantation. Donors and their families must fully understand the risks and benefits of organ donation before making a decision. So it is not should not be that, okay, he has asked for the organ, give it. No, not that. They must fully understand the benefits. If that person, is, as I told you, if that person is suffering from diabetes and he gives away his uh, pancreas or iris or hands, then that is a drastic and catastrophic effect. Because that's the source of his own insulin. He can't do that. In fact, that organ is already damaged. That's why he is suffering from diabetes. So that organ will be of no, not much, mild benefit, moderate or no benefit at all to the recipient. Other ethical considerations include the fair distribution of organs, the use of living donors and the potential for exploitation of vulnerable individuals. It is important to consider these ethical issues in order to ensure that organ donation and transplantation are conducted in a morally responsible manner. That is, maintaining the privacy, the confidentiality and the psychology of the donor and the recipient. Organ allocation, distributive justice, fairly divided resources, equal access, maximum benefit, limited resource, cadaveric organs, presumed consent, incentives and prisoners, these are fallacies and they are increasing, though they are increasing organ donation, this should not be followed. Problems with cadaver organ donation, community problem. No awareness of brain death concept or misconcept. They don't have the um, knowledge of what is brain death. They're just as I've told you, they're in the ventilator. They won't be in that person off. Let him succumb, but that person doesn't succumb. 
it's where unless and until you wean in that person out of ventilation at the it is rather a sort of euthanasia but unless and until you do it that person will stay for days and days in the same condition situation this concept they don't have or they have a misconception that they are doing it forcibly they are not letting my family member to survive hospital probably no efforts to identify and maintain brain dead donors that is declaration of brain dead they don't do it at the earliest they are ah, i'll do it later on like that the medical professionals are very bad ones they are busy with other their own practices and everything they don't care about the least about not all everywhere you want to answer it they care least about declaration of brain dead but how much it is important for an organ donation they don't uh, they don't understand and government problem is funding and interest where the government has interest where there is a will there is a way this i have told you already the sections and section 11 is prohibition for removal or transplantation other than therapeutic purpose the organ should be retrieved for therapeutic purpose if at times it is found even beyond therapeutic purpose organs are donated that is for purpose academic purpose just i think in the paper in west bengal there was a 27 years old boy who died in rta road traffic accident and he has donated six or seven organs this is he had already donated his whole body other and they had retrieved six or seven organs and that benefited really a lot but uh, after death the parents did it that's i the cornea the kidney lungs both lungs both kidney heart liver small intestine but this uh, is a really great feat because still this has created a lot of do do it has created a lot of psychological upset due to the death of the person they believe that this person is living in someone else's body this psychological uh, assurance or satisfaction this is another reason why people want to donate that this person my person my family member my near and dear one is living in someone else's body so ethical issues will be autonomy that means it shouldn't be forced voluntary voluntary very voluntary beneficial to others non maleficent there should shouldn't be any invested interest free and informed consent there should be respect of dignity of the dead bodies the donors and the recipients there should be integrity and equality of human beings there should not be any diver uh, diversion of uh the process that is confidentiality should be maintained and fairness and it should be in the for common good not eligible for transplant as i have already told you challenges despite the many benefits of organ donation and transplantation still several challenges that must be addressed one of the main challenges is a shortage of available organs despite huge population in india only 0.01% of people donate organs they do not they just do not if they had then the availability of organs would have been much more and this has been realized and in us uk spain and other countries where they freely donate organs one of the main acha other challenges include the cost of transplantation the risk of organ rejection and the need for ongoing medical care after transplantation this is very important because after kidney transplant what happens the immunity of the subject decreases and this person has to spend excessive money in different injections intravenous uh, medications each medication might be per day that person might have to take two or three three or four times and each injection costs 5 to 10000 and this is a huge expense and that person does it because that person has taken the organ to survive if that person doesn't uh go for the follow up 
taking the post-operative medicines, then that draft will be rejected. Even despite the taking all precautions, graft can get rejected. Addressing these challenges requires collaboration between medical professionals, policy makers and the public. So these are the recent developments that 3D printing to create artificial organs and tissues which you have started, artificial heart, artificial lung, artificial uh, that is skin synthetics, polymers, artificial hair, these have all been started. Other developments include the use of stem cells to regenerate damaged organs and the development of new techniques to reduce the risk of organ rejection. Stem cell is nothing but every body has uh, just like atom, they have certain root of generation of every cells and that root is, that is a common root, it's called stem cell from where all the lineage of cells get derived. White blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, macrophages or platelets and uh, all the organs, everything is laid down from a single or more stem cell, polystem cell, generation germ cells. And newer and newer techniques have been, have started to be undertaken to reduce the risk of organ rejection. By addressing the challenges and continue to make advancement in this field, we can ensure that organ donation and transplantation remain a vital part of modern medicine. So organ shortage is a crisis, however the crisis has a cure. And this is, you have to educate the people, advertise it, make them understand through network or sharing resources, expertise or, and organs. Use media to promote. Media is a very good promotional agent. Get religious head to participate. This is a case where in tribal community, not to be the person's consent is accepted. It is the head of the tribal community, that person has to give consent. Otherwise, that person is not, by the tribal community, allowed to donate organs. So, there are other sects also, religious sects and all. They have this uh, protocol. Have transparency in program, set up regional transplant coordinators forum, which is already set up. And social appreciation of donor family, that is... How praise how this person has donated so many organs. This is something which satisfaction we have. This is something that is it didn't it is regarding any bodily harm <coughs> that can start from a minor offense to a grievous offense. That is uh sexual assault, sexual harassment, to even homicide. So this bodily harm, there are number of sections in IPCs and CRPCs of criminal procedures, IPCs, Arms Act and other acts which are more better known to you people, which protect and guide and give punishments for any offences, a crime, a criminal, uh, to the criminals. Punishments dealt, uh, given to the criminals and prevents offences. So, here there are certain things which are, for us, uh, certain things are very much rampant now. One of them is sexual offences child trafficking, then um, child abuse, women trafficking and um, any other sexual, natural and natural sexual offenses, perversions etc. Secondly, we are, there are certain civil offenses which are, uh, which take place like um, certain threats and certain uh, regarding properties and lands or might be certain uh, de-reputation remarks 
or just nothing at all, if you take it for something, someone has passed some remarks. Some boy has passed some remark to the girl. Why? If you are, we shouldn't say it, but if a girl is not properly dressed, then a boy has a right to say. He might pass a comment. And that is not right though. But this is the girl should take a precaution to dress properly so that the boy doesn't have the right to comment. Or if in our society drinking is not or smoking is not so much rampant in ladies, females. Society bans it, not law. But if the person is absolutely drunk and comes back at night coming home, that is not good. Someone might commit some crime unintentionally or under certain under certain uh, conditions. Of course, homicides. Homicides can be culpable or not amount culpable. Homicide amounted to murder and not, uh, not amounting to murder. So if these I don't have to say, you know better than me, you will teach me. That is mainstream and actors here. will teach me better than the, my saying. So, um, homicide can be also done by psychological aberration, aberrant pain subjects. Or with intention, with pre-planning, everything. So, these are bodily harms. Even after birth, if a child is a single male child between three to five years, the first child of a working parents who are not able to manage the child, then that child might be battered. It might lead to batter, battering the baby, battered baby syndrome. And that is very difficult to find out. The child will give histories when separately asked. On different okay, uh, examinations, you will find different stages of injuries. On radiological examination, other examinations, you will find fractures of bones, etc. So such cases are very difficult to find out. In dowry deaths, in dowry deaths, there can be two types of assault or combined. One, there can be physical assault. There can be more there. There is a mental assault. Just because a person hasn't been able to fulfill the amount of dowry demanded or the in-laws might be asking for more and more because they're getting there is a resource. There is a source of dowry. They are rich or they have, they are managing somehow. At times they are not that rich. They are managing somehow. So the flow is there. So they are going on demanding and demanding. Mental pressure. The person, female, becomes very much upset and at times she herself commits suicide. And bear the life. Or at times it happens that if mental harassment goes over to a physical assault, then here in our country it's very rampant child and women trafficking. This is a professional business for people from different ages, from small age to the older age. Then comes sexual assaults. Sexual assault is rather an aberration of the mentality of people. It's not necessary. The sexual assault can be one way, one way traffic. It can be also in a heterosexual individual. So you have to identify whether that person is a gay or a lesbian. There it falls in the same thing. Or it is a hetero. It is a, between a man and a woman. At times there are incest. That is a blood relationships. At times there are perverted people going on doing it as a psychopath, a manic. 
even mania can occur the sexual revolution one of them is mania that can lead to homicide manic killing serial killing even certain perversions are there like sadism masochism voyeurism exhibitionism fetishism fraternalism urinism these are all perversions where a people feels satisfied on beating the female partner or male partner a free person feels satisfied on being beaten by the partner that is sadism and masochism a person being a peeping tom and peeping do that is feels gratification on seeing the private parts of the other just peeping through the holes i holes and key holes of bathrooms or etc then just brushing in a crowded bus if someone brushes against a person that is also voyeurism then if person feels satisfaction gratification by touching other means taking uh, touching or taking others belonging fetishism urinalism is also another one so these perversions are these are all sexually perverted so these can be or a person can be assaulted repeatedly either sexually or physically so these are all bodily harms which are being done and these come under the purview of the law where most of the times it is found except for homicide most of the times it is found that they do not take recourse to the law out of social stigma out of fear fright even in homicide also it occurs but if they do to some extent they are justified justified because if once they lodge a gd what happens that person has to narrate everything in front in public to the police go there several times and being harassed by the police if the police is purchased by the other person other side then he might be harassed more and more be it a genuine case of dowry mental physical assault or a fear or anything the police hardly rescues unless an uncle the fatal incident occurs they do not arrive even after that if their family comes into action goes to court they are also they are most of the times don't provide with the evidences is they do not act properly apart from that after police comes a society due to social stigma a sexual assault cases they fear they they are afraid of going to judiciary not a complaint well judiciary has taken a lot of precautions so that they are kept their their uh, confidentiality is maintained like nowadays the names of the victim are not revealed but at times the defaults but if you if one tries to correlate the things it's very really easy to find out so still these people also feel to some extent that they have to go to court so many times at times after some time they get tired they want to withdraw they want to let it go so justice is not properly given over there the judiciary officials they are their hands are bound so in that perspective this is a medical jargon It's an essential aspect of forensic medicine, some basic terminology. 
The language used by healthcare professionals to communicate effectively and accurately about patients' conditions and treatments. They play a crucial role in interpreting medical documents and reports related to offenses against the human body. Understanding the medical terminology is vital for forensic pathologists, coroners, and other medical professions who investigate crime involving bodily harm. It's a foundation of communication between healthcare professions. That means if an assault case has occurred, so it might become a case of orthopedics, of surgery, and ultimately it become a medical legal case of forensics. So the healthcare professionals become from emergency medical officer to the de uh, separate departments, they come to the autopsy, they come or might be for injury report. And once they come to the medical legal departments, then it becomes a legal issue. Ultimately it goes to the legal issue because it has been booked in the police under police cases. It's a standardized way of describing the human body's functions of the disease and injuries that can affect it. In forensic medicine, medical terminology is essential for proper interpretation of medical documents related to criminal uh, cases. So we, as a medical legal personnel, have to document whatever we say. We are experts of certain cases, but we can be called by the court if the documents are not properly evaluated properly. Understood? Any expert can be called. Usually, very minimum, but they are called. So, accurate interpretation of medical reports can help determine the cause of death, identify potential suspects, and provide evidence for legal proceedings, just as I have said. Like, in a gunshot injury, as I have said, if you get a firearm, the police have recovered a firearm, and there are bullets in the body, you have recovered the bullets, the medical legal person have recovered the bullets, and the ballistics are involved, they are being given the bullets and the firearm to test whether both this firearm has, can fire those bullets, whether they are, there is an association between the two. If there is an association, the ballistics will give an expert opinion, and that expert opinion can be taken as such, or if it is not understood by the judiciary, they can call the experts to confirm his opinion to explain his opinion. It is not the fact that always IEA always says that they can't be called, no. But and, uh, it is desirable if needed to resolve any confusion which arises from the documented portion. And our part is always document everything. This is not only for our part, this is a key thing which every person should remember. Document everything. Because at any step, you might be falsely implicated. The common medical terms include contusion, these are all mechanical um, injuries, laceration, fracture, hemorrhage and abrasion. These are different types of mechanical injuries. Here the people find a bit difficulty in understanding what is abrasion, what is contusion, what is laceration, what is hematoma, hemorrhage, it's extravasation of blood. So if a medical person has to elicit the meaning, abrasion is there is a breach of skin, contusion is underlying extravasation of blood, laceration is involving the soft tissues and muscles, fracture of course you understand and hemorrhage can be anywhere in the body, either deep seated or scalp hemorrhage, they can be hematoma also, that means collection of blood forming a tumorous like mass, or can be fluid blood. Other important medical terms used in forensic medicine include toxicology, which is a study of poisons and their effects on the body and pathology, which is a study of diseases and its cause. So, you might find that a person has died out of say castor seed poisoning. Castor seed as such if it is engulfed, it goes out. But castor seed, the juice, it is highly poisonous. Though it has a commercial value in increasing in uh, hair, increasing the hair growth length. If you apply castor in hair, it increases length of the hair. It has a 
value, commercial value in rheumatism, in pain, we can use castor in osteoarthritis and gouts. But castor juice is highly poisonous and can affect. It has an um, antitoxin, a vaccine rather, that is resinous communis. Castor is resinous communis and resinous communis has an opposite antitoxin which can help the person to survive. So forensic toxicology is an important portion which you uh, have to understand. Say a uh, viper bite. A person has is complaining that this person has been bitten by a viper. A viper has two fangs. There will be two punctured wounds of the skin accessory part or any other part. Well, if the viper gives an oblique bite, there will be one puncture wound. So that has to be differentiated from Sui Sutari. Sui Sutari is formed out of castor. That is, it is by certain other portions, they make needles, which they use in between the fingers as cattle poisoning. Come up on the cattle, uh, buttocks of the cattle. So that will give one single bite. So whether it is viper poisoning or whether it is viper is a hemolytic uh, venom or whether it is uh, suicidal, a vegetable poison, this will have to be differentiated. Otherwise, you can't manage the person and you can't. Viper poisoning is an accidental poisoning. But suicidal poisoning is a homicidal poisoning. So this you have to differentiate. So poisons are in a similar smaller dose, all medicines are therapeutic. But in a larger dose, they become poisonous, even paracetamol. So you are being given an overdosage of the medicine or not, that has to be assessed. These are all actually at the fag end is the judiciary, at the basic end is the patient. In between lies the medical personnel and the police. So this chain of custody from the patients to the judiciary has to be maintained. Otherwise, the judiciary won't be able to understand what punishment has to be given for a particular case. So if the patient receives an overdosage of medicine, say he takes uh, sleeping pills, and one night is found dead in the morning. He takes only one tablet of that sleeping pill. Suddenly it is found that the whole bottle is empty in the morning and he is lying dead. So whether it has been given to him or it, he has accidentally taken it, that is very difficult to elicit and that can be def uh, elicited by circumstantial evidence from the people. The police has to be, has to extract it from the other things which are lying around, from CC footage, that is another AI of course, CC footage, from everything, he has to come to a decision. And the medical personnel who has treated, they will say this is such and such poisoning, overdosage. Well, how the overdosage occurs, that falls under the medical legal experts while doing autopsy. After taking all the judgment, all the findings, and the examination reports, all the documents, is a judiciary who comes to a judicial decision making whether it was accidental, suicidal or homicidal. And it is a very tough uh, role on the part of judiciary to delineate the thing. Three. Just like a burn injury, that is another body harm. A burn injury, whether it is accidental, suicidal or homicidal or fall from height, whether it is accidental, suicidal or homicidal, it is very difficult to elicit. But there are certain cases called, certain, certain things called crime reconstruction, reconstruction of crime. If you can reconstruct the crime, you will find that if a person falls by accidentally from the top of the roof, then he is liable to fall near the premise, the wall, unless until the 
there is any obstruction. That is, he is falling accidentally. So, the head will be down nearer to the crevice. If a person commits suicide, he will try to jump forward. So, he will usually land on his legs. And those legs will be nearer to the crevice. Head will be far away, but his whole body will be far away from the crevice wall. If the person is homicidal, then the offender, the criminal, he will give not a slight push. He will give a good push, fall, fall far away from the body, from the premise. And here, depending upon the circumstances, you, can, you have to see the PO and everything. You will come to a conclusion whether, because he will fall when he is pushed. There also, he will fall on his head first. So the head will be nearer and how he has been pushed, where he has been pushed, whether there is an obstruction or not, it will decide. Similarly in a burn case, that is another body harm, it is a burn case, the other one was fall from height is an assault. Now in a burn case, if the person is accidentally burned, so it is not possible, it is possible, probability of full body burn is not always possible. It's an accidental burn. So what happens if that person is in a sitting position, those places with access to the um, fire or flame is not there, that part will be unburnt and that person will try to save herself or himself. So there will be not total body burn, including the hair, scalp. But if it is a homicidal burn, what that person does, either throws kerosene or burns completely either inside closed or charred body or the kerosene has fallen has thrown kerosene all over the body the whole body gets charred burnt in a case of suicidal it's also the same thing that is at first the reflex the impulses to commit suicide so she has poured kerosene on his on her body on her not always here this way, just throws over the body and sets a flame of blaze. But after once she has started burning, she has every tendency to save herself. So there is, it can be a total burn, but in most cases it is a partial burn. The depth of the burn is not much. So depending upon these circumstantial evidences and others, of course, you can come to a conclusion whether the suicidal or homicidal accident is. But these have to be put forth to the law to come to a decision whether this punish, whether this person is to be punished for homicide or for accident or for suicide. Whether this person will be punished or not, who will pay the compensation accident or whether it's a homicidal occurrence. And effects on the body and pathology also. Pathology that means a person is found dead inside the home. In the bed, the doors are just, just closed, not locked. And in the morning, this is unnatural death cause case. Police intimated, gone to the for postmortem. But this person was suffering from heart disease. He is aged about 60 or 70 years of old age. Every possible autopsy surgeon found that it is a case of heart, natural heart causes. So there is no foul play. So what to what, so the those findings are placed before the presiding officer of court and he comes to a conclusion for everything that this is a case of natural death. So these are the terminologies which are used in forensic medicine, other terminologies are salt, battery, uh, hurt, grievous hurt, simple hurt, then dangerous weapon, then um, dowry death, sexual offenses, offenses uh, due to abortion and pregnancy. Like uh, previous, uh, simple heart 319, these you know, IPC. 
320, give us a dangerous weapon 323 to 326. Then uh, assault 351, 354 battery. Then um, 304, B, I think B, and 498A. Yes, I, I just get confused. Now we did. And 304A, 498B, road traffic. Then 302, 300, 299, 201, suppression of a evidence. Then, uh, learn this medical termination terminology, nothing but go through the books, go through internet, go to websites, try to remember if not law allows you to see the books. That's a reference and it's recited. It is not that you have to learn each and every part of the medical things. So you have to refer textbooks, online courses and flashcards. And one effective way to learn medical terminology is to break down complex terms into the component parts like hemorrhage. Hemorrhage can be broken down into two. One is hemo. Hemo means heme. Heme means blood. And rage is excessive flow. Flow. So hemorrhage. That is excessive flow of blood. And hematoma, as I told you, heme and oma. Heme means blood. Oma means tumor. So the blood is clotted to form a clotted blood tumor-like mass. The role of forensic pathologists in criminal investigations, they examine the body, find out, try to find out, go for pathological autopsy, try to find out the cause of death, take out the specimens, go for histopathology of the organs. And as you have said that it is a cause of cardiac arrest, so they'll go for acute AMI through histopathology and they'll find the sections confirming it is acute AMI. To do this effectively, forensic pathologists must have a thorough understanding of medical terminology and be able to interpret the medical documents and reports which they are being supplied. They have to know everything about those. Otherwise, it's difficult for them also. Secondly, it is difficult for them if the specimens which are taken, collected and preserved and stored is faulty. They need proper 10% formal, formal saline, that is uh, in saturated saline of in normal, uh, common salt, you have to give 10% formally. That's formal saline, it has to be preserved properly. If the percentage is a little less, then they can't make sections out of it. They can't go in for a microtome section that specimen gets denatured, decomposed. So it becomes valueless and they won't be able to make pathological signs to pathological slides and come to a conclusive diagnosis. So there the fallacy lies. They work closely with law, they work close with law enforcement officials and other medical professionals to ensure that justice is served in cases involving bodily harm. It is an essential component of medical uh, forensic medicine to communicate effectively and accurately about patients' condition and treatments, help forensic pathologists interpret medical documents and reports related to criminal cases. Now, this is what happened in COVID cases, COVID 19 cases. The forensic pathologists have been called upon to diagnose that it's not a case of respiratory arrest or otherwise, but it is a case of. COVID-19 pneumonia. So there, with taking all the healthcare precautions, they have collected the samples, sent it for the histopathology sites for COVID-19 pneumonia findings. Even in unnatural death cases, those become posed a great problem to the medical legal personnel because in road traffic accidents, you have to come to an opinion of accident. If subsequently, after admission, that person develops COVID due to hospital uh, infection, then it's very difficult to, for the medical legal autopsy surgeons to go and do it 
means give his opinion as RTA and the pathology they won't want to go for histopathological slides but somehow this justice has to be done in such cases in collaboration with all the three disciplines. Learning medical terminology takes time and effort but it's a valuable investment of anyone interested in pursuing a career. Of course you all don't want. So, Oh, these are sample collections. You have to collect the samples. Uh, this is another one which I have told you that I have done it from NCIFS, the Sexual Offense Training of Delhi, which is um, Sexual Offense and its specimen collection. They gave a big kit. So huge box with so many envelopes and so many papers where to collect all the samples, stand, make the victim stand on it and then so that nothing is lost and big big papers and nail cuttings, hair, pubic hair, axillary hair, take blood, take urine, uh, everything you have to collect of course with the swaps and uh, preserve it, we are preserving and keep it. This, this is called a safe kit. Safe kit. Sexual uh, offense kit. Assault. Examination. Forensic examination. Evidence kit. So this huge box. Uh, a box. Huge box. I still have it home. Two huge boxes they have gifted us. Uh, so we never use those. We just use it in a very brief way, that is we collect the pubic hair, we collect the blood, vagina swab, in a use the urethral swab, public urethral swab. Um, of course, if other places are needed, we take like teeth bite mark, teeth bite places, uh, those bite marks. Of course, this is another very loophole which the, these people do, that is, you should bring the victim or the accused immediately. If there is a delay, then either washing, changing of clothes, or which are the reasons, bathing or something, these are lost. So, in POXO, of course, you all know that is in 2012, that's POXO Act. This has uh, undergone a lot of amendments, and latest, what they have, uh, one is they have obliterated that, of course, it is a very recent observation out of the box. So, that you can't say by write the names of the victim address, uh, any father, parents name, etc. So, in these cases, you have to examine the person immediately, at once. And if the medical legal expert is not available, go for a preliminary examination. I don't know what is the relevance of Going to court, take the opinion, means order, sorry, order of the court and then come over to the medical legal expert after preliminary examination. Because in several cases I found that it's not written in POPSO. It is done by the police personnel. Whenever we tell them, they say, no, this is a order. I said, show me in the POPSO Act. It's not there. Not at all there. They go for a prelim exam in a gynae. Later at night they have caught, okay fine. But they will bring them after seven, ten, three months, three years after court order. So what nonsense is it? What will we find over there? Everything is healed, no specimen is there, nothing is there. What to do with it? They won't understand. So many times we argue with them but they don't understand. And second thing is, uh, you can have to take them anywhere, feasible nearest portion, where the medical expert is there, especially the lady doctor. If there is no lady doctor of that department, any allied department, if that is not there, make an examine in front of a female attendant if the victim consents. Or any doctor nearby, any nursing home, anyone, any female doctor has to be there. 
person has to be there. And um, thirdly, uh, of course, here in most of the cases, because they are minor, it is found, as I told you, most of them I have found, I have done so many cases, they are all, all false. Only four or five percent, they are real basis. I have done about 15, 14, 15,000 cases. These are all, all false. It cannot be true. If it had been true, then everyone had been eradicated from the place. It's not possible. Most of the cases when taking history, if in front of the parents, they won't. They keep them out shut. Looking at the parent, not saying anything. But if it's taken aside, <coughs> you'll find that they are telling you actually what has happened. Because they're afraid of the parents. At times, they have done it voluntarily. They have fled away, have gone uh, away. Voluntary. There is no coercion in that. Of course, due to law, they have been booked. Otherwise, there is no coercion in that. In that case, of course, your role is afterwards, it's like you perhaps, perhaps, if it's not such a thing, at times uh, you convict a punished uh, male persons, otherwise, you can let go of it. depends upon the merit of the case. But uh, the specimens which we collect is mainly those things and if they bring in a delayed uh, date, we usually don't collect. It's no use to collect the specimens, but I don't know why the judiciary press us, uh, why haven't you collected it? What is the use of collecting a specimen after three months of occurrence? Even after two days after occurrence, there is no value. If there is <coughs> washing, bathing, changing clothes, you know, take the clothes. But that examination of that portion is taking samples of them. There's no, no. You won't get semen, any survival evidence from there. It can't be confirmed. Still, it is done. <coughs> and DNA, of course, this is a very important thing because DNA samples can be extracted from anywhere of the body even from the genital parts or any other parts, uh, from the, even from, from white marks, from any other mask, scratch marks, anything. So, whatever the technology is, our portion is to get all the materials, analyze, form a decision and put that forward. That's it.